How did fish go to land? An evolution out of the sea. In the beginning, the earth was without form and void. The planets were forged as the nebula spun, jolted into motion by a nearby supernova. Around 4.5 billion years ago, a molten earth began to cool. Violent collisions with comets and asteroids brought water, and the clouds and oceans began to take shape. Over the next few billion years, single-celled organisms fused and became multicellular. Yet all this abundance and life was restricted to the seas, and a vast and bountiful land sat unused. It was in the Middle Devonian, roughly 385 million years ago those prehistoric fish crawled out of the water and began the evolutionary lineage we sit atop today. One early theory suggested that the climate was changing and becoming drier, and that early tetrapods evolved limbs to move from one body of water to the next," says Lars Schmitz, a paleontologist in the W. M. Keck Science Department of Claremont McKenna, Pitzer, and Scripps Colleges in California and a co-author of the new study, published in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The habitats that these animals occupy today are not necessarily the ones in which they have always lived or in which they originally evolved. There is evidence that our ancestors braved the dry world very early on, even before most terrestrial plants or insects, so it's possible Earth was barren. It is still unclear exactly where the transition from water to land took place ecologically. As they emerged from the sea, they gained something perhaps more precious than oxygenated air. Information. In air, eyes can see much farther than they can underwater. The increased visual range provided an informational zip line that alerted the ancient animals to bountiful food sources near the shore, according to Malcolm McIver, an Arashantist and engineer at Northwestern University. Aquatic creatures rarely gain much evolutionary benefit from an increase in eye size, and they have much to lose. Eyes are costly in evolutionary terms because they require so much energy to maintain. Photoreceptor cells and neurons in the visual areas of the brain need a lot of oxygen to function. Therefore, any increase in eye size had better yield significant benefits to justify that extra energy. They found that there was indeed a marked increase in eye size during the transitional period. The average eye socket size before transition was 13 mm, compared to 36 mm after. If you live and hunt in the water, your limited vision range makes you operate primarily in reactive mode. You have just a few milliseconds, equivalent to a few cycle times of a neuron in the brain, to react. According to McIver, it's likely the first land animal started out hunting for land-based prey reactively, but over time, those that could move beyond reactive mode and think strategically would have had a greater evolutionary advantage. The ancestors lived fully in the water and had skulls that were tall and narrow, with eyes facing sideways and forwards. This allowed them to look around in their watery environments for predators and prey. However, as ancestors of the first tetrapods began to live in shallower waters, their skulls evolved to be flatter, with eyes on the tops of their heads. This probably allowed them to look up to spot food. These first tetrapods came from an ancient lineages of fishes called the Sarcopterygii or lobe-finned fish, of which only a few survive today. As the name implies, these animals have meaty, paddle-like fins instead of the flimsy rays of most modern-day fish species. These lobe fins, covered with flesh, were ripe for adapting into limbs. Living in air instead of water is fraught with difficulties. Locomotion is one problem. Some of the earliest tetrapods, like Ichthyostega were quite cumbersome on land and likely spent most of their time in the comfort of water. These early tetrapods had to develop more than a new way to walk. Their entire skeletons had to change to support more weight, as water supports mass in a way that air simply doesn't. Ribs and vertebrae changed shape. Skulls disconnected, and necks evolved to allow better mobility of the head. Bones were lost and shifted, streamlining the limbs. Joints articulated for movement. Overall, it took a long 30 million years or so to develop a body plan fit for walking on land. At the same time, there is another obstacle. The air. With gills adept at drawing oxygen from water, early tetrapods were ill-equipped to breathing air. It was the fish's digestive system that adapted to form lungs. The first tetrapods to leave the water breathed by swallowing air and absorbing oxygen in their gut. Over time, a special pocket formed, allowing for better gas exchange. Another problem is, air tends to make things dry. 
As a human, we have highly evolved structures which ensure that all that water doesn't simply evaporate. The early tetrapods needed to develop these on their own. It's likely that many of the early tetrapods began experimenting with ways to waterproof their skin. Finally, these crucial adaptations to tetrapod skeletons and anatomy allowed them to conquer the world above the waves. Until now. Thank you for watching. Here are some references used in this video.